All right. So, uh, so last week we covered two sections. So we covered evangelism and missions and education. And I just want to point out, as we start to get into these later sections of the Baptist faith, the message, what we'll find isn't so much that there's differences between denominations. Like, you're not going to find a denomination that, like, says education is bad or evangelism is bad. What we're finding is differences in emphasis, right? Now, so that brings us to our or to topic of today as we start off is stewardship. Again, you go to any denomination, right? We should be good stewards, right? That's nothing wrong with that. That's biblical principles. It's the emphasis on it. So uh, we'll go ahead and read it, and then we'll, we'll talk about, you know, the highlights here. But it says, uh, Article 13, Stewardship. God is the source of all blessings, temporal and spiritual. All that we have and are, we owe to Him. Christians have a spiritual debtorship to the whole world, a holy trusteeship in the gospel, and a binding stewardship in their possessions. And therefore, their obligation to serve Him with their time, talents, and material possessions. And should recognize all these as entrusted to them to use for the glory of God and helping others. According to the scriptures, Christians should contribute of their means cheerfully, regularly, systematically, proportionately, and liberally for the advancement of the Redeemer's cause on earth. Now, again, stewardship in general, you're not going to find any problems with. with you go to a Catholic church, you go to a Methodist church, a Lutheran church, doesn't matter. Yeah, we should be good stewards. The difference is the emphasis. Now, in Baptist churches like today, we would we use offering as a time of worship. It is integrated into our worship service. Now, that's not necessarily uh, what would you say universal across. All Baptist churches, but it is probably the most common uh, thing. And so when we give of our, our, we call tithes and offerings, then yeah, it's it's part of the worship service. Now, we also go a step in, in Baptist churches. You'll, like, um, I guess a couple months ago now, end of January, we had a business meeting, right? Not so much... As members of the church and us being good stewards, we come up with a plan for God's money, right? Or the money that people donate to the church through their offerings, and then we make a plan for it. And we make that plan public. Like, it is it is delineated. Uh, you can go get a copy of the budget. You can see exactly where the money is going, how much it is, and, you know, you can... At that meeting, that's your time to agree or disagree, or you know, we can have a discussion about that. So, again, the emphasis in a Baptist church is the emphasis is on stewardship. If you go to other churches, yes, they good stewards, but you may not get a list of the the budget and where things are going. You may have to ask, or you may just like that is, you know, part of the greater cooperation. Like the United Methodists, it, get, it kind of all flows in, and then they trickle it back down the other way. Uh, Catholics, kind of the same way. Like it, it flows into the church, and then they handle it from there. Whereas Baptists, because we're a loose confederacy, if you will, it flows into the local church, and then the local church will send some of it to the greater, I guess, convention. So, especially Southern Baptist, we spend, you can look at it on the budget sheet, most of that money stays at the local level, and then we send some of it to the associational level, the Western Baptist Association, and then we send some of it to the convention level, or the, um, yeah, the convention level, where they distribute it worldwide for missions or whatever. And at each one of those levels, you can get a budget report and see exactly how much money is coming in, how much money is going out, and roughly where it is. Now, all this is 
kind of undergirded by the fact that it's everything that we're given, right? And this is kind of the what I really wanted to point out here. Everything that we're given, we're a steward for. And this is a, a bit of a shift of mind here. It's not just the money that you give to the church, right? It's everything, everything in your life, your house, your car, your retirement account, everything is part of what you're responsible for. So you have to think of it, it's not yours. You are a steward of what God has given you. And that's, it's a different way of thinking that most people, you know, have to take time to adjust to. Morning, Peg. Morning. Um, so as we go through this, God is a source of all blessings, temporal or the physical and spiritual. Okay. And all that we have, we owe to him. Yes. Everything in this life, we owe to him. Christians have a spiritual debtorship to the whole world. Now, what does that mean? We owe the whole world. What? Our money? Is that what it's talking about? Remember, it's, it's talking about spiritual and physical things. I'm kind of giving it away, but, you know. Well, it, you know, like, it kind of falls back to the Great Commission. Our job is to reach the other people. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and with what? With everything that we have. Yep. In every way that we can. Mm-hmm. But most importantly, it's the word of God, the good news. Yeah, the good news. That's our our debtorship. That's what we're we're given stewardship of that. Yep, that's right. And I always consider everything I own belongs to God. I'm just here to look after it. Yeah. You know. And that and, that is the way and, we should look at it. Uh, we we want to express the love of Jesus every chance we get. Mm-hmm. But we also want to express it in the life that we live. Yeah. By being an example. Exactly. And that we actually covered that in, um, mm-hmm. I think, evangelism and missions. Mm-hmm. Right? Hard to evangelize and tell people about the good news when you're, you know, cheating on your wife or, you know, yeah. stealing from the yeah. stealing from the bank. So, absolutely. So, we have this stewardship of the, the message of the gospel. Right? For some reason, God has determined it to be so that, you know, where to go out and share the good news. A holy trusteeship in the gospel, that's kind of the, going along the same lines, right? That's really repeating it. And a binding stewardship in their possessions, like our possessions. And therefore, we're under obligation to serve him with our time, talents, and material possessions. Now, that is something that people miss. When we talk about stewardship, it's not just about stewardship of financial resources or taking care of your car. Stewardship of your time, which is probably the most valuable thing and the hardest thing to take control of is we all have 24 hours in a day. And I would say if you're wasting it a lot, if you're vegging out on the TV for 12 hours a day, that also would fall under you not being a good steward of your time. Now, I'm not saying you can't have time to relax or unwind, right? But there is a stewardship aspect to your entire life, and that includes your time. Because if you're vegging out on the TV for 12 hours a day, that adds up, and you could be doing a lot for the kingdom of God in that 12 hours. So maybe an hour is acceptable. Again, notice that there's no like hard and fast rules here. This is different for everybody. Through an extremely stressful week. Okay, you know, maybe 12 hours a day just to kind of let your brain unwind. Maybe that's okay. That's, that's between you and God. What I'm saying is if you're vegging out 12 hours a day every day for like five years, maybe that's a little bit excessive. And you're going to have to answer for that. So, we do have, uh, just be reminded that we're stewardships of all aspects of our life, right? Time, our talents. Um, This is something I'm trying to get through to Leanna and Mitchell, right? Leanna has a talent for singing. Is she using it appropriately, right? That's a talent I don't have. 
If God asked me, hey, why didn't you sing in church? I've got an answer. I can't sing. <laughs> Easy. Me right? But, you know, that's going to be a different answer for Leanna. Yeah, scripture don't say you got to be good. It just says well, you made a joyful noise. Well, it's a noise. It, what if my noise takes the joy away from others? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, all these things that we have to answer for. And I would encourage you, like, if, if, you're, if you think for yourself, man, I wish I could do more, right? It may be that the church, you know, just for whatever reason doesn't know about your talent then it's up to you to bring that up to the church. Hey, I have this talent. Where can I use it? Right? Now, I don't know what that is. Right? That's going to be different for everybody. I have a talent in IT, like technology. So, you know, I try to bring that here in the middle of nowhere in this little country church without any internet. Right? And now we do. But, you know, that's, I do what I can. Yeah, and well, well, maybe, but that's just, I'm just using that as an example, yeah. right? You all have talents, like we got motorcycle club over here, we got former firefighters, we've got, you know, people that travel in RVs and, you know, maybe can't read a map, you know, <laughs> you know may, maybe, maybe Susan and David should get together and, and partner. So, so, and, and notice it says you're under obligation. This is something you ought to do, right? This isn't, this isn't a question. It's, it's, this is what you should do. Now, um, time, talents, and material possessions. Notice that that's possessions that's not just we're not just talking about money when we're talking about stewardship everybody gets all up in arms about money and money is for whatever reason God has deemed it to be so but money is not the end of it right for example we've we've had um uh, get-togethers out here and David has brought this portable light that he has that's a material possession Right? That is, you know, something that we can use. It's not, uh, I'm just bringing that up as an example, it's not just money. I know many people have used their trucks to haul stuff back and forth, their trailers, you know, whatever it takes to, you know, bring forth this, this gospel message. And so, you know, the next part of this, we recognize that all of these are entrusted to us to use for the glory of God and for helping others. That's it. Everything. And it's not just at the at the risk of repeating myself too much, right? This is more than just the money that you give in the, the offering plate at the church. Right? Now, this next part does specifically talk about money. According to the scriptures, Christians should contribute of their means, which is your income, however defined, in five different ways. Cheerfully, regularly, systematically, proportionately, and liberally for the advancement of the Redeemer's cause on the earth. Now, do you have to tithe? Still. Still. No. No, but this is man-made. This is a question for the class, right? Because... You all are aware of the tithing requirements in the Old Testament. I think you should okay. do it. And a tithe, yeah. like from the name, 10%. Bet so. Between you and God. Between you and God. Yeah, you okay. Do it, yeah. I don't now, think somebody you told me, so, well, you're not really working now. You're drawing your Social Security and your teacher retirement. And I said, that did not matter to me. Then God didn't tell me not to keep tithing. So mm. right. for me personally, I feel like I do need to keep tithing. Okay, okay. So we have a couple different viewpoints. Yeah, it's a good starting point. I mean, if there's no, it, it does belong to God to start with. Mm-hmm. So let me, let me loosen the requirements. Maybe not tithe, but is it a, a spiritual requirement that we should give? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. So the question isn't the giving. The question is how much? Right. Well, I've always found that the more I gave, the more I got blessed in return. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Okay. So and that's a nice spiritual oh. answer. And that's I love it. And forgiven either. I'm sure if he, you know, most of us are coming from the same spirit. We see a need and we want to help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of distinguish between the two. The tithing is 10% and an offering is anything above that. Yes. Yeah. So, and that's why we say offering and the tithe confused a lot in that kind of deal. When you're making an offering to somebody, we do. you're giving extra. And, you know, Kenny has, has had a whole series about the actual tithe, and it's closer to like 23% a year, 20% for two years, and then 30% on the third year, if you go back to the actual Old Testament. And then you can do offerings above that. Now, if you run the numbers, that sounds awfully close to the average income tax rate. I know. Just saying. <laughs> so, notice that the, the five methods here, it doesn't say a number, right? There's no 10%. It doesn't even use the word tithe. But it does have some characteristics. You should contribute cheerfully. God loves a cheerful giver. That's perfectly biblical. If you can't give cheerfully, you have some spiritual work to do. Well, I think the tithe is part of teaching us to have a cheerful spirit about giving. It is. It is. Right? Because, again, it's this mindset. Right? This isn't, this isn't ours. We're just asked to be stewards of it. We're asked to give regularly. Whatever that means. Every day. Every week. I think most people today take it as every paycheck. It's fine. That's how I look at it. Whatever. <laughs> if you'll notice, though, like some, you can see, well, we don't actually, you can't actually see this in our budget reports, but you can see at the end of the year, there's a huge spike in giving because people are lining up for their taxes, they're getting end of the year bonuses, or, or uh, what do you call it? Um, withdrawals from their retirement accounts or whatever, right? And that's great. It's just hard to plan around spikes, right? So I think that's why this is in here. But some people, you know, they do get paid irregularly. Uh, I knew a, well, we had a friend who was in the real estate business and it was kind of boom or bust for her. Like when she got paid, it was like, you know, multiple thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. But she could have that two months in a row and then nothing for six months and then you know that's the way it is with me you know if I yeah don't work i don't get paid so if i stay home for a month we don't get made nothing for a month yeah yeah so you know again no hard and fast rules right but i think it is important for us us spiritually is to make that part of a regular practice right it shouldn't be something that oh well i got a little you know i got this surprise reimbursement I'll give to the church now. This should be part of your regular process of giving. Systematically. So what's the difference between regularly and systematically? Well, it seems very That's a great, just a great question, Peg. I was just about to bring that up. <laughs> You're on his side. Great minds think alike. Well, we'll talk about what is that, what's the difference between regularly and proportionally and liberally mean. But systematically. What does that mean? What's the difference, as Peg said? If you get paid regularly, you give regularly. You get paid systematically, which means when you work versus when you don't. When you get paid. System, systematic just means there, there's a, an order to it, a thought process to it. So... Say, for example, you get paid, you know, every bi-weekly, you get paid every other week. But maybe you decide for your budgetary purposes, you pay it, you know, I'm going to write one check a month to the church, right? However you want to do that. That's still regular, but it's systematic. It's, it's a thought-out process. And you could think ahead of time. Like, okay, we have a building fund starting up. Now I want to adjust my giving because we have fund-based giving at the church. I want to, you know, of the money I give to the church, I want, you know, 50% of that to go into building fund. Or maybe I want to, okay, well, 
you know, I was going to sell this car and I want to donate a portion of its proceeds to the church. That would be systematic. You're, you're thinking it out logically to an end, right? I think that's the difference. That's why they set up different funds for the church, like the cemetery, the church, and the building funds and things, because mm-hmm. a lot of people have people buried in the cemetery that donate money to yep. the cemetery upkeep that doesn't give anything to the building fund or yep. the tithe. Right. Yep. But they're going to make sure that you know, of course, this up here, a lot of them passed on. They're not giving there. Yep. Yep. So, so in when this comes to keep up here, that. What's great is my background in accounting, right? We went over fund based accounting. And if you give to a fund legally, it has to go for that use. You cannot be moving stuff around. And for cemeteries specifically, at least if you start a new cemetery in Georgia, I don't know if this one has been grandfathered in but it has to have so much in the account to provide an annuity to pay for the maintenance of said cemetery, Mm -hmm. basically in in perpetuity, right, forever. That makes sense. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. Instead of waiting, because then you have, what's happened is you have a lot of older cemeteries, the people pass on, and then it gets lost and forgotten about, and then, you know, like you could see in some of these early, early, early cemeteries in the country, people forget about them, then they rediscovered, or they try to build on them, or well, you, you know, we want to avoid that. You take it like an old cemetery. Once it's full, there's nobody else going to buy any spot there. Yeah. And then once they're there's no income. All pass on. There's no one left to donate to that cemetery. Dormant. Mm-hmm. Point. This church so. decided to take care of that cemetery up there that they discussed. They said nobody wanted to pay anybody to keep that. Hose or whatever we had to do to get the grass out from around the grave. Yeah. And cut the grass with a push yeah. board. Every, whoever wanted to do it showed up on Saturday, but then yeah. it just got cleaned. Yeah. No yep. more. Again, so, stewardship is, is part of that planning process, mm-hmm. right? If you're going to do it, you're gonna have the cemetery. You gotta have the the means to do it, right? And you gotta plan for that. And if you're gonna pay somebody, say it costs, I don't know, 500 bucks a month to mow that cemetery, and we all know how inflation works. Right? Next next year it'll be you know 520 a month, and then next year you know you set up a, a fund you know that has investments to basically self fund it. That's how they do it nowadays. I don't know how this is run. That's uh, Daryl handles a lot of that if you have questions. But same thing with the with the church, right? It's not just building this building when we had the building fund. You also got to plan, well, that's a new building that requires cleaning, requires maintenance, more electricity, more gas, right? You got to have the resources not just to build it but to maintain it. Something I'm also trying to talk to Leanna about. She's also She's all about getting a car. Right, and she wants a truck. Fine, fine. Love the truck. Love the truck. Got no problem with it. But you got to pay for the gas, and trucks get less gas mileage. Right, and it's not just. It's not just. It's not just the truck. It's the maintenance of it. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Anyway. That's. Oh, in America especially, but. Anyway, just as an example, right? These are things that we're thinking about systematically, right? When we're thinking about our giving. Proportionately. Now, people love to have this, but I think this is a biblical principle, right? When we go back to the Old Testament and we look at the tithe, it was a percentage based. And what that means is, if you have more, as in absolute terms, you give more, right? If you have less proportionally, or in absolute terms, you give less, but proportionally, it's the same percentage. Now, uh, we have the same concept today in our income tax, right? You have tax brackets based on percentages. Um, And I, I think that is an appropriate biblical principle to have, right? If we have wealthier members of the church giving less than the poorer members of the church, something is skewed somewhere, right? 
Now, I again, I'm not saying numbers, right? It's just people who have more are entrusted with more. And, you know, if they're being stewards more, then they should understand that God's belongings, right, are entrusted with them more. And they should right. give more. That's part of it. Does that make sense? Say the word poor. I think it would be more like what everybody's expenditures are, are kind of. Well, I, I say poor in, in just material possessions. Say, I could say wealthy, less wealthy, yeah. um, you know, higher income, lower income, right? right. You, you get what I'm saying, right? I'm, I'm not going for the, yeah. I'm not winning any political correctness awards here, yeah. right? But we're talking about a serious topic. Right. And what I, I think the principle exists, like if we have a millionaire in this church like David over here, then. Oh, that David over there. Yeah. So if, if we have like a millionaire and we have somebody that's barely struggling to get by, it's only logical, right, that the millionaire is giving more. Absolutely, right? Same proportion, but in far as absolute terms, right? And when we, you remember that um, example that Jesus gave, the, the poor woman uh, giving, the giving the yes. couple of coins, and Jesus makes a point of that, you know, she gave all that she had, yeah. right? Well, that's absolutely a compliment to her from the Lord, but it's also an admonishment to the rest of the people in that crowd, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It should not be it's so a, way. It should not be that way. Mm -hmm. Right? When you're talking about tithing, it goes back to the story I heard about the millionaire who stood up in the church and talked about how he was a millionaire now and what he did when he was given to the offering. He gave everything he had at one time, but he was broke. He took all mm -hmm. his money out, put it in the offering plate. Okay. And then he said, oh, look at me now. I'm a millionaire. So he gave him faith. He got through with his big speech. When he sat down, his buddy bumped him on the side right there and said, I bet you won't do that again. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, notice, you know, when we when we look at the um, the scriptural data, right? It also talks about giving in secret, right? Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's talking about, because it's yeah, you don't want to boast, right? Nobody's boasting. We shouldn't be boastful, and right, the idea is you're building up treasures in heaven, right? That's the idea that the Bible uses, right? So. I think of it as an investment account. If you're working, right, I was taught to save a certain percentage and you save that back because you're gonna retire one day, you know, maybe an emergency happens, you need something to fall back on, okay? I think of heaven the same way, right? We're building up treasures in heaven. Now we all know the reality of the situation. We need money here, right? We gotta eat, right? We gotta you know, have a car to go to our jobs, to be productive. Like, there is a, a stewardship part of just knowing how to use money, but there's also a stewardship part of knowing how to save money. And then there's a stewardship part of knowing how to convert that into spiritual wealth, right? When we're using our money to spread the gospel, right? It's not that you're going to have the treasure is going to be diamonds or something in heaven. That's not the treasure. The treasure is other souls in heaven. Right? We're building that up. So, you know, when we give proportionally, that's what we're talking about. Again, I leave it up to you to determine a percentage, right? But I would say it's probably, if you just do the math with me, let's do the math. Okay, there's, on any given Sunday, uh, I've done the count from the back. You know, a good Sunday for us here is 45 people, okay? So, if every family is tithing, which is the way I assume it's going, that probably brings us down, let's say it's 30 families, 30 families tithing or, or giving. I don't want to use the word tithing, giving, because I don't know what amount they're giving. But let's think about this. If all 30 families are giving 1% of their income, then that would mean that the church has a total income of about a third of what the average person has, or the average income for the average person here. Now, the average income in this area is about $47,000 a year. 
which would mean the church's income is about a third of that. So that's 17. Somewhere around seven. It's somewhere around 17,000. Okay. Now, that's the entire church budget. If everybody's tithing 1%, right? That's just math. Now you tell me, right? Based on what you see and what you know, is that going to cut it? Absolutely not. Probably not. Probably not. I pretty much saw the, all this stuff running. I, I would just, I would give this advice, and I'm not telling you what to give, but when you do give, think about what it would look like if everybody else gave the same amount as you, and then see if that number makes sense. Now, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with the biblical principle. I think 10% is probably a nice number to start with. But I understand people have circumstances, people like maybe you've given your whole life and then all of a sudden like you have an emergency surgery and it's kind of wiped you out. I understand that. God understands that. There's not, we're not getting into, we shouldn't be about like calculating to the penny, which comes into our, our this last one here, liberally. Because there are churches that you'll go to that in order to become a member, you have to give a tax, your latest tax return to them. Oh, that's not I, I, I hear I'm not a member of those churches, uh, right? Uh, okay. Now, I understand where they're coming from, but I don't think it's up to the church to determine that. Mm -hmm. I think the church should be providing spiritual discipleship to where if there is a giving issue, that shouldn't be a problem, right? Because we're all maturing in our, in our faith, right? So when we give, just look around and see. Okay, there's 30 other families giving like I am. If, if I'm giving maybe 1% and I do the math and, man, I don't know how the church would run on that. Well, maybe it's time to bump it up to 2% or 3% or whatever. But is it more important? The amount that you give or the fact that you are trying very hard to faithfully give every chance you get. Yeah. That is where the liberally comes in. So, okay, let's let's okay. let let let's use this as an example. No, no, you're you're fine, you're fine. Let's say you bring home ten thousand a month. And I'm using this because I like round numbers. I want that though. It's too early. <laughs> so you're Biblically sound, and that's a thousand dollars a month that you're going to give to the church. That's ten percent, right? Math is easy, okay? So you're getting, you know, you're getting your your check and you're writing it out and you write a thousand dollars. And I've done my, I, I'm good with God. I've I've checked the box, right? But think about this. Maybe maybe you bring home nine thousand a month. So that would make your check, or your your if you're doing the 10%, $990. And you're getting out of your wallet. Whoa, whoa. 9000 Oh, wait. 900 would be $900. Sorry, I was thinking. Nine, in my mind, I was thinking 9990 because I changed the example at the last second. You bring home $9,000. Let me change this because this, is, this isn't going to work any other way. Let's say for some reason you have an extra deduction out of your account and it's now you bring home $9,990. Okay? Now 10% is $990. 999. Okay. So it's $999. And so you dutifully right go to the bank and you say I need cuz you're giving cash in the plate, let's say. I need $999. And they're like, well, we're, we're not doing that. We'll just give you uh, 1000 And they give you, you know, $1,000 bills. If you're the kind of person that's going around breaking that $100 bill down into ones to give $999, I, I'm just saying that maybe your heart's not in the right place, right? And I, I think that's the biblical principle here. If you're, if you're that... Dog, yeah, that's the word. If you're that dogmatic, <coughs> a, I don't see how you could be a cheerful giver, giver, and b, like it's. Why are we? If you're just giving to check off a box, you're missing the point, right? And what's that extra buck? 
And what's the extra dollar to you, right? right? Now, for some people, right, if you're only making $10, right, maybe that extra buck does yeah, make a difference. A big difference. I, there's no hard and fast rules here. talking all this. My morning started out with me burning my breakfast because I get a call. Mm -hmm. There's a couple that has a well phone problem. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to show up now. Yeah, they, as they, they do. They had to inv be evicted from their home because the bank sold their note. Mm -hmm. The balloon note had done went up so much they couldn't pay the mortgage. They had to be out within two months. Mm -hmm. They found a house to move the well phone on there. Okay. They are both on Social Security. Yeah. Can't pay it. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing stories after stories like this. So yep. when you go talking about giving and they don't even have, and yesterday of all things, they lost a key to a truck and cost them $225 to have a key there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm listening to all this this morning, rolling over my head. I said, look, yeah. y'all please let me go to church and go to a funeral today and then come back and get the yeah. cell phone? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's and what I'm saying. And, and then get off the phone and I have a guy that has plenty of money has a dryer trouble. He wanted me to come over this afternoon and look at his dryer. Mm -hmm. You could very well go buy you a dryer in your mm -hmm. place. But he probably doesn't want to spend money. He does that. He knows Brian knows what he's going to do when he comes over there. So, so the, these are the real world scenarios the world that we world hit scenarios that I'm in all the time. Every day. And that's, this is why I really don't get into. I was at your grandfather's house yesterday. Oh, yeah? I was too. Yeah, he told me. And I asked him specifically, do you need me to do anything? No, I'm fine. He doesn't tell me nothing. Well, we'll catch that later. We'll catch that, that train later. Something Debbie couldn't do. Okay. Well, you know, it's just, when we talk about all this giving and everything, when you're talking about at least 40-something percent of people out there can't even make income now, their bills. Okay, so this is the reality. This is where it comes down between you and God. This, this is the reality of the situation. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do this? Because we haven't talked about that. The average income in this area is 47000 now, that and I'm getting this from census data. I looked this up, but 23% of families in this area are below the poverty rate, federal poverty rate. Okay, these are all these are all reality facts. Which means two out of ten people in there are somehow below poverty. Which is, if you've looked at the poverty rate, you know it's based on number of people. But for two people, it's like twenty thousand a year. Right? It's pretty low. It's really low. These are things that we have to consider when we're talking about giving. You give as you can, right? Mm -hmm. If you have zero, right? 10% of zero is still zero, right? Math still works that way. But we also have to be liberal with our, not only our giving, but stewardship. And we're all part of this together. Some people cannot give financially, but that doesn't mean that they don't have time or talents or anything like that mm -hmm. and that, I think that is an important part that people miss out well, I don't have anything I can't give you no. well we need plenty of volunteers well, right, trust you know, me what you did yesterday going by and see your grandfather meant more to him than any else thing you could do to give him that time time it's out of the question for people to stop by and see people like that. so as I get older mm -hmm. right the thing I, I value more is my time right mm -hmm. right and I, I, I get all, I've, I've heard the questions, I've, I've actually asked some of the questions. Well, is that 10% of your net or your gross? Mm -hmm. I would just say, that's probably a very spiritual, immature question, right? right? And I take that. If I'm hearing that from a, a, from a teenager, right, they're getting their first paycheck and like these cents make a difference in their life, I answer it with grace and, you know, gently suggest that that's between you and God whatever you are cheerful in giving, right? Give from that, right? And then work forward. But if I'm hearing this from like a 60-year-old man who's been in the industry for a while and we're at this point asking this question, maybe that's a talk about, well, you know, why? Maybe go into a little deeper conversation. Are we giving for the right reasons? Why, why do you give? Do you think this is, we're giving because God somehow, you know, needs money Right, because people think that too, which is, it's not about that at all. Yeah. Right, this is a, a spiritual maturity process yeah. of giving and stewardship for for us. God doesn't need money. 
right? Because God doesn't need houses or, or cars. Like he, He'll make it happen. We are part of that process. And in that, we get to share in, in, in giving God glory, right, through the appropriate stewardship of his assets and also giving because it, it also helps us to know just, just a smidgen of what he gave for us, right? That's, I think that's where all this is coming from. Hey, giving is something that I deal with some people talk about all the time. I got a person that gives to animal cruelty Mm -hmm. won't give $19 to St. Jude's Hospital because she don't know where the funds go. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, where's the animal cruelty going? But then what? I have a guy that just told me, just passed, I give $19 a month to St. Jude. Mm -hmm. I was out, and he said, I give $19. Ever since my kids, my grandchildren have been in and out of St. Jude, I give every month. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he, he says, I feel good about that. Yeah. Sounds boring. And, and that's great, right? Yeah. We're, we're introduced to things, things all the time. Important. I was introduced to the importance of blood giving when yeah. my dad was going through his stuff in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. not realize how important blood, I just kind of took right. it for granted. There's blood somewhere. Didn't right. realize, no, there, there may not be blood right. somewhere. And they have to ration it, right? There used to be big pushes back in the 70s. Yeah, I did not... Did not realize until I, you know, until he needed it. And I was like, oh, crap, where's that coming from? And they're flying it in from Montgomery or something. Like, so, yeah, we're, we're stewardship. And blood is an asset. I think this building right here is a perfect example of the giving. Mm -hmm. Because when we got the metal part of the building put up. Us guys came out here all the time, worked out here. Yep, yep. I know I can speak for David and I both. We got no experience doing carpenter work. Yeah. You know, and they're just a couple of the guys that, had, you know, but we were all in here learning and doing. Yeah. And, and we got it done. We figured it out, you know. Yeah. And uh, David will agree with me. Those uh, hallways where that ceiling does that. Oh yeah, I can't, I can't imagine. But and it it's almost straight. Uh, yeah, and, good job, guys. And, but you know, we gave them our time. We came over here a lot of days, spent all day, and we mm -hmm. all left here dog tired every yeah. day. But we laughed and had fun every day we was doing it. Yep. And I was blessed greatly. And that's that. and that's a great stewardship. Yeah. But to extend on that, if we built this building and did nothing with it. That would be bad stewardship, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. That's why it's so important. We're, you know, we're getting ready to actually put this building to use, yes. right? And that's why uh, we were out here yesterday. And I, I don't know anything about metal work. They're talking about welding something together to put the basketball goals on. You know, I'll be happy to hold something. I, I, I don't know, right? Well, you ain't got it's all welded yeah. up. Yeah. So, now, so, it's good. so, anyway, the, this idea of stewardship. Now, th I will say this: this isn't to give you know, just willy-nilly, right? Part of stewardship is also to be responsible and to be aware of, is your money being spent wisely? Um, you know, and I would encourage you, if you have any doubts, and I hear this all the time, well, especially with the Southern Baptist Convention and uh, some of the controversies going around, you know, up top, if you're aware of these, well, where's my money going? You know, is it paying for all this stuff? I encourage you, go research it for yourself, right? Um, and if you can't get answers, that, that may be an indication of maybe you don't want to give to that place until you can get solid answers. And it's what, Charity Network or something, I think, is where you can There's th There's a couple places that give like a rating to charities. Um, and they, it says they give X percent for yeah. administrative and X percent for yeah. this and that. Yeah, and so I would encourage you to, to look out and see, you know, if even at your local church, this church, if you have a question, where's my money going, right? Mm -hmm. Ask, right? And you should be able to get an answer. And if you can't, now I know if you ask Kenny, he'll he'll print you out the sheet, and, you know, show it to you on his phone or whatever, right? But we, we're not just called to give, oh, well, you know, we should give to the church. Well, you, you should also be aware of where your in investment mm -hmm. is going and what is it doing, right? Yeah. Same thing for anywhere. I'm the secretary, I'm not treasurer, 
Mm-hmm. But, um, but when we don't have a meeting, let's say we had to go to another event somewhere and we didn't have a meeting, we always donate, cast a hat, whatever, <coughs> donation to the chapter and donation to the missionary. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. when we're not, let's say we didn't attend that meeting, mm-hmm. the next month I double up on that missionary money because I know where it's going. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I don't, I'm just, I, that's just my heart. Yeah, you know, yeah. I like to make sure that we keep it going. Keep it going. Well, not everybody in our chapter does. Well, that, I understand you that. Know, but no, I don't say anything to nobody. Yeah. That's your that's regularly. That's given your well, regularly, mostly, systematically. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I, thing. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to tell you something, too. You know, we all fall short and stuff. But like you said earlier, not only just material possession, you talked about our time and talent. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you a story. When we first started coming here, Maria backed me up on this. I, you know, I've sang in choirs and stuff all my life, and I told Marie, I said, I want to go to church. I just want to sit, listen to the preaching, and go home. I don't want to get involved in no choir dinner. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do nothing. I just want to go to church. And, 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 and first Sunday, we come here. We sit up there, kind of in the middle on the right side back there, and Kenneth Murphy's mom and dad, Miss Juanita and Miss Arnold, sitting right in front of us. Mm-hmm. Of course, we stand up to sing the hymns, you know. Of course, I sing like always, you know. So as soon as church is over with, Miss Juanita turns around and tells us how much she enjoyed my singing. Well, thank you, thank you, and all that. So that was on Sunday, right? So Tuesday, she's calling my house, inviting me to join the choir. And it's the first time we'd ever been here. Yeah. You know, you know, and that's just the Lord telling me, you need to use your talent. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't just her. There were several that just kept reaching out to me, you know, yeah. Well, Miss Tony did the same Ms. thing for Carol and I. Yeah. yeah. No. Well, Miss Tony did it to me, you know. Yeah. Miss Alma Jean did it but to me. First, Jack did it to me. But when we know, first, so. our very first visit here, I have to admit the choir was terrible. Mm-hmm. You know, but well, when you had have a couple somebody of people. that sings as good as y'all do, it made everything so much clearer and it's just well, so much nicer. Well, yeah. be critical of me doing the best we all do the best. I, know, <laughs> yeah, well. I mean, even but Kenneth Murphy was up there doing doing the you know leading well, the singing and stuff. Everything has changed so much now. Y'all yeah, thank, no. Dave, y'all thank David. David for that because he was the king and he was the first one at the early age started worshiping the Lord in song and music yeah. and everything, bringing it, lifting yeah. it up. Then when they had more song, they had more worship and they had more blessings from the God from God. Well, and all all this related it's to stewardship, good. right, yeah. is, right, I understand that there's times that we want to rest, mm-hmm. right, but I understand, you know, resting is for a time, right? Yeah. Even when we look at... David's the singers now. Yeah. There's well, Ecclesiastes. Yeah, Ecclesiastes, or time, the time for everything. Yeah, that's right. But that was just him telling me, you know, you're not yeah. going to sit back here and go to church. Yeah. I'm not going to lie yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. But no, giving should be cheerful, but if the... The Lord has blessed you. You should want to reach out and try to bless somebody else. I mean, and that's where the cheerfulness comes from. Exactly. It's the realization. And you know, people who aren't cheerful givers don't realize that. Going back to you know, seeing where your money's going, and just like David was talking about building this building, mm-hmm. we have a purpose for this building, and we want to use it. For that purpose, yeah, you know, and and so the people out there can see, you know, yeah. what their money went for, and God is glorified. Yeah, that's, and that's the biggie is to give God the glory and, and to make sure. Yeah, and right. this building is an easy example because, like, when you give, like, and you see it come up, like, you see where your money's going. It's very yeah, visible. You guys want to but, hear something that's been happening in the last three days? Uh oh. Young people, the young millennials kids that are eight or nine or ten years old that are questioning what they're hearing, what they're seeing, what they're doing, and prophecy is coming alive where the children are going to start to prophesy, mm-hmm. have visions and dreams for the old men. Mm-hmm. I've been having for a while to raise up children that's knowing what's going on. But in the last three days, I have seen kids that want to hear the truth, want to know the truth, want to attend something where there's no violence. Yeah. Okay. That is what you see out there. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Hey, you can't get the parents to do. You don't have to beat up the parents to bring the kids. Well, the kids in general are talking to them. God, God well, saves the remnant yeah. somehow. Huh? That's what right. you tell them we got a bus to go pick them well, up. That's why well, that's where I like where uh, Rojova said when he went picking up the children and mm-hmm. bringing them to church. And mm-hmm. the parents started having to come to see what was going Man, on. Man, this is a great that idea. That has got to be something if only we're looking for. But the children are out there, people. We had a bus. I home children at another one yesterday. Yeah. Really want to know. Yeah, no, I, I. Is this real? Is this what's going on? And that's what we're called to do, and we're trying. And but again, it takes resources. We have a bus out there that sits there 99% of the time. Oh, yeah, 99%. Who can drive? Right? That's a resource that most people have. Where is it at? Right? And you see, like, if you give. If you're a good steward, right, and you're managing your talents, right, that bus would be running around. Absolutely. But again, we're not all in the same place. I think I'll tell you, I've got all kinds of buses. Can a woman do something around here, or is it all men? You could drive that bus. Women, women do stuff around here. Women do stuff women around here all the time. They will do right. stuff. Yeah. They'll probably bump. <laughs> when, uh, if you want to drive, like, come on. Yep, you got to be on the insurance. Well, look here. This, this community right now, I know of at least four young ladies with at least two to four children. Husbands done out of the picture. Mm-hmm. And the kids. Yeah. And these ladies are really getting worn down. Mm-hmm. But to try to get them to... Okay, well, they weren't brought to church. When they I, under, I understand, church. right? And, and it's going to take some ladies to talk to them. And, you know, we, as God puts them in our lives, and we reach out to people. To Same thing, we put around all these basketball I things and yesterday. concerts. Like, wow. like, it's not, and this is, okay, we're kind of getting yeah. off track here. Yeah, but, yeah, but, right. but, you know, to be yeah. stewards, yeah. like, we have concerts, right? To me, that is part of stewardship. Like, this is a time and talent. We, we want to attract people with the good news. We have a place to have this. So we do it. Um, basketball camp. Uh, all this is part of stewardship because we've been given much, this building, right? We got to use it. So that's kind of it. Is there any questions about stewardship? I actually wasn't planning on spending all this time on stewardship, but but everybody loves talking about money. So, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Well, it kind of ties into the outreach committee, too. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So we had the big outreach committee, and we talked about all these thing, all these ideas, right? Again, stewardship, and then, right, these ideas are going to take money. They're going to take resources from the church. We're going to have to use the fellowship hall. We're going to have to use some paper plates, right? right? All these things cost money at the end of the day, electricity, gas, but... That's what we're here to do. Is, is that a good use of resources? But this is also why I always come back to, after the fact, did we accomplish what we're supposed to be doing? Because if we spend all this money, right, and there's zero return for it, should we do it again, right? Even though we had a great time, even though, but if its function was outreach and we don't outreach, then we have to, you know, ask ourselves, I, at least from my perspective, we have to ask ourselves the question, is that worth doing it again? Or what can we change to better, to be better effective? I see a lot of but, the issues we have is when we have events, people invite their friends who already are a member of another church. <laughs> why can't we invite people that are not going to Why church? can't you have non-church friends, yeah, people? Really? Right? <laughs> anyway, that's, that's a time for another day. So did that, did that concert get a lot of people in? Oh, we had a good crowd. I don't know if I'd call it an outreach, okay. right? There, there was, uh, I guess by the time it was all said and done, probably 50-ish people showed up. Well, it's a good time. Loved it, but was it outreach? Doesn't sound like it. Yeah. When money was hard to come by, they, the ladies out here used to sell cake. Mm-hmm. They were selling eggs, they were selling goods, and they were donating to the church with yeah. money. That was an outreach because they had a lot of people coming by just a bunch of rural areas. Yeah, I agree. But but times have changed since then, times too. Times have changed a lot since then. But. So anyway, 
So you can see all the, all the different facets of stewardship, not just money, even though people get all up in arms. It is part of the spiritual maturity process is to learn how to give and to give cheerfully. And not just of your money, but of your time and your talents and your possessions as well. And so some, some people don't even know what their talent is. Yeah, yeah, and you know, or their gift is. we'll we'll help them find we it. We need a survey. <laughs> Maybe that's a study we could do. Yes. That okay. Would be a great study. Okay. okay. We, we need a questionnaire. Yes, we've done it. Yeah. Said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a pretty good study. I was going to say the whole study was about wow. Survey. People just were like. I didn't know I could use this for a talent at church. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I didn't know all my talents either. Mm -hmm. I just had no. to give to dad. And that's to that's part of the maturity process is, mm -hmm. is finding out. So, okay. Well, next week we'll start on cooperation, which is probably the defining emphasis characteristic of the Southern Baptist Convention uh, is cooperation. And, um, oh, yeah, I totally missed this, but we'll because we're going to bring it up next week, that, that article that I sent out to the text group talking about the, the differences and opinions going on in Southern Baptist Convention, mm -hmm. um, we'll bring that up next week on cooperation um, <laughs> because that talks about at what point, the question is at what point versus not. And that's kind of what that article is delving into. So we'll talk about that next week. Um, so no, typically, we have Sunday school on Easter. No, no, I'm saying, are we going to do this or are you doing more of like an Easter? No, oh, no. I mean, I, I hope you all understand what Easter is about. I feel yeah. like we've been through this. Um, well, you like to like throw in wrenches and say I think so. things. So, you know. Yeah. Because everybody's, everybody's already here usually, so we went ahead and go ahead and do it because everybody's here. Um, Otherwise, it's kind of weird. It's like this weird timing. So, I don't know if I will be here at sunrise. I'm doing good to get here at 9:45 with kids. But if you are here, it's always a good time when I have them. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, but no, we're going to continue on with this if that's okay with everything. You'll get a nice Easter message. Um, two, and I feel like I mean the people in this class are aware of Easter. I feel like we've talked about it. I consider it the second greatest Christian holiday, first greatest being Pentecost. Well, but well, they all tied it. They all tie together. They all tie together. So it's like one, two, and three. But without Easter, without the resurrection, Christianity would not exist. So, but without the Holy Spirit, which Jesus said was greater than He, I'm just saying. Or he said we would do things greater than he with the Holy Spirit. So. But he couldn't use tongues to do that with well, I'm just, just I'm just saying. Jesus said we were going to do things greater than him. Easter lesson next week because you're going to throw a wrench in everything. So. <laughs> Will I throw a wrench in everything? Yes. Will it necessarily be about Easter? No, not necessarily. Yeah. Um, but then to remind everybody, you won't be here oh, yes. next week. I'm going to I'm going to send that on text. April 8th and Seven, April. 7. 7th and the 14th, we will not be here. We're going to see the eclipse, and we're going to, um, we've got to stay behind to get the mm -hmm. storm shelter installed at our at our property, and they're coming out, so, okay. to avoid a bunch of back and forth. There'll be and, two Sundays in April, we're not going to be here Yeah, either. so hopefully everything still exists after the eclipse. I'm already, my friend's already telling me that the world's going to end and all this oh, stuff, and I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, we've already been through this. If they'd only been through the study on the last things, they would know. Let's see. Okay. So, yes, we had one in 2017, and we saw that one. That came over Georgia. Uh, this one is coming over. We're going to Arkansas. But this is the last total solar eclipse in North America for, like, the next 40 years or something. So. We're going to go see it. It's always really cool, if, especially if you girl. Yeah, got the glasses, especially if you see a, the, the total solar eclipse. Mm -hmm. Partial ain't going to cut it. Like 80%, I couldn't even tell the difference. Like it's only until you start getting to like the 95% that you can really see a difference. But, but anyway, we're over time. Let's close in prayer, and then uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this opportunity for us to come together and, and study your word through the Baptist faith and message. I pray that you'll... 
uh, open our hearts and our ears to the, the spiritual meaning of giving and uh, just allow your spirit to be in us to, to give cheerfully and to give reverently to the work of your kingdom. Father, I pray that you'll be with us as we enter the message and as we go out and be a light into the world for you.